All right, let's do a quick testing. Can you guys hear me through the webinar? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Are we good? All right, our tech has confirmed that both audio and video are good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our eLotus webinar today. My name is Donna Chow, and I will be your host and your moderator for today's class. Today's class runs from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. We'll have a one-hour lunch break between 1 and 2 p.m., two short breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. We will not be going through the whole eight hours <laughs> straight. Uh, here at eLotus, we... Our, we pride ourselves on being the largest online CEU platform for acupuncturists. We have over 100 speakers that you can learn from and over 400 courses. And if you're here looking to learn the, the stuff, the clinical applications that will actually work in your clinic, you have come to the right place. And we wouldn't be here without the sponsorship from Evergreen Herbs. So at this time, I'd also like to thank all of our Evergreen customers joining us today. A little housekeeping before we get started, what you are seeing on your webinar screen right now. So if how many of you out there, this is your first time, go ahead and type in first in the chat room. And I'll give you a quick tour of the webinar room. On the top left-hand corner, you will find the video feed. And to the right of the video feed is the PowerPoint for today's class. Now you can download the slides, the PDF format, uh, the handout, the lecture notes from the blue course access page and this is the page that you were on when you clicked the green button to enter today's webinar room. And on the bottom you'll find three boxes. First box to your life left is the chat room and here in the chat room is where you can chat and meet and connect with your colleagues from all around the world. I read earlier that someone's from Belgium. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us at Odd Hours. <laughs> And if you would like to private chat with anyone that you see, such as an old classmate, you can private chat with them by clicking on the menu button at the top right-hand corner of the chat room. Last two boxes to your right, you'll find upcoming eLotus events and information about our sponsor, Evergreen Herbs. If at any time during the webinar today you experience any clinical... Uh, any difficulties, technical difficulties, such as slowing, skipping, or stopping, that's usually due to internet connection. A lot of people are using wireless, and wireless is, you never know what you get. It's a lottery. <laughs> so uh, we highly recommend that you sit closer to your router, and if at all possible, try to use an ethernet cord with direct internet connection. That's the best, but even using that, sometimes the internet's not that great because uh, it depends, maybe your provider, something's going on. So if you tried everything and it's not working, just private chat with either Sam or I, Sam's the tech, and we'll be able to help you. Also, if you are logged in more than once in the Adobe Connect room, you will hear an echoing sound. To resolve that issue, just close the extra login, or after a period of time, Adobe does remove the extra login for you. All right, let's get started today. The best part is the class. <laughs> Today's class is Dong's Acupuncture Top 20 Points for Immediate Results with Henry McCann. Henry is the author and co-author of Dong books, Pricking the Vessels, Bloodletting Therapy, and Practical Atlas of Dong's Acupuncture. And just to let you guys know out there, if you purchase, because you attended today's webinar, you are able to get a signed copy of either one of his books when you purchase it through Evergreen Herbs and I'll send you guys a link to buy the book. So once again, you can get a signed copy with a per with when you purchase a book. Dr. McCann is a faculty member of PCOM in New York and also teaches for the doctoral degree program at Oregon College of Oriental Medicine, American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine. It's such a pleasure to have him come out here today. I'm sure it was hard leaving the snow and the cold to come here to sunny California. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Henry McCann. Thank you. Are we, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so Today we're going to spend the day looking at, uh, at some of Dong's acupuncture. Uh, my intention is to spend the, the first part of the day, at least probably, not all the way up until lunch, but at least the first couple of hours, discussing some, just a little bit of basic history where the system comes from. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that some people today, uh, either here in person or, uh, or 
somewhere else in the world have looked at Dong's acupuncture before and some people may be new to the system. So since I do think it's useful for us to have an idea of where things are coming from to help us understand just sort of the, the context of what we're looking at, uh, I'll start today with a little bit of a, a background of Dong's acupuncture. We're not going to go into too much detail, but just a little bit of a background. Uh, and then we'll look at <coughs> more in depth the question of uh, some of the, the theoretical concepts that are going to help us understand why we're using certain points, when we're using the points, and how to best really sort of think of the material, at least in my opinion. And you know, the caveat here is always that you know, the, the ideas expressed in this, in this, uh, in this class are I take responsibility for their, how I look at the material, how I find it useful to look at the material, and certainly people will have differing opinions on how best to approach the material. So hopefully we'll look at, uh, look at things in a way that's useful, uh, and uh, hopefully then it will translate into being able to better use the points. One of the comments that I hear from a lot of people when learning this uh, system's approach to acupuncture is that you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the material that's out there, a lot of the way that people at least think of it is that, oh, it's just this long list of extra points. And you know, I went to school for how many years and I had to memorize how many points already. Why the hell do I have to memorize more points? And then it seems to be more of this idea of drudgery that they, it's like another however many hundred points is just too much for most people to think of. My opinion is that if we're just simply memorizing the points, then we're, we're missing some of the bigger pictures of, of not only how to study acupuncture, but how acupuncture works. And so that's why, for me, it's important to go through the material that helps us understand why and when we're using the points. So that it's not just a random list, that you don't have to necessarily have to memorize lots and lots of indications. <clears throat> when I first learned this material, I simply memorized all the points and all the indications. And I practiced like that for quite a long time. And I can tell you it does work, although I do think it works better if we have an understanding of really when certain points are more appropriate or less appropriate. And then my other big hope, of course, and this is, I say this every time I teach this material anywhere in the world, is that even if you never use any of these points, even if you never use a single one, if by going through the material and looking at it more deeply, it helps you better understand what you're, what you're already doing, and it makes you question what you're already doing, then it's worth, it's worth the, the price of admission, so to speak. Right? When I go to classes myself, I, like, I go to a lot of classes, and I really enjoy it. I never like going places where someone tells me what I already know. You know, if I'm going somewhere where someone's just going to tell me what I already think, then it's like it's a waste of time. I like to go somewhere where someone's going to tell me everything you learned before is worthless, and here is the new way. Come to the light, and I will show you how to really do something different. And I don't necessarily believe them, but if it challenges the way I think about things, then that's the important part, right? Sometimes. I believe them eventually and say, okay, this is a great new way to thing to add to my practice. And sometimes I eventually say, no, you know, that really wasn't that great. But when I, the way I come to it wasn't that great is because it makes me really reflect more on what I'm already doing. Right? So even if we never, if any of us never uses any of these extra points, if it helps us reflect on what we're doing, become more analytical practitioners from, from what we were before, then it's worth it. Certainly it's worth it. <coughs> uh, and then, of course, we'll get into actual points. Uh, I told Donna yesterday that uh, I'm interpreting 20 points rather loosely. <laughs> so <coughs> if, you count some, if you count it one way, you'll get to 20 points. If you count it a different way, you won't get to 20 points, and that's okay. We'll just go through some, some good points. Uh, and we'll talk about the, why, the reason why sometimes I'm counting groups of points as one point or, or not. All right. Uh, if we have questions as we go through, I know that people can type in questions, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, I understand there are a lot of people with us today, so we may not get to every question, but hopefully we'll get to some of the, they'll probably be overlapping questions, but hopefully, hopefully we'll get to a number of them. And if people here in our live studio audience have questions, then feel free to let me know. Okay? All right, so <coughs> let's just look a little bit, uh, a look at a little bit of the, the history of Dong's acupuncture. <coughs> First, a little bit on the Romanization. Uh, most of you are probably aware that Chinese as a language is not written with an alphabet. Uh, it's not written with, with, it's not written based mainly on sound symbols. This is not true for all Asian languages. Korean, for example, is written with uh, a type of alphabet. Japanese is written with a combination of sort of like an alphabet and not. 
with the Chinese characters. But Chinese is written traditionally with characters. So one of the challenges we have is taking these characters and rendering them into Western languages. Right? So the, the process of rendering into Western language is called romanization, at least putting things within the Roman alphabet, which is the alphabet used to write English and most Western European languages. So there are different ways of romanizing the family name uh, from this great acupuncturist by the name of Dong. Uh, in the pinyin romanization system, which is the one that's more or less the academic standard these days, the spelling is D-O-N-G. In the old way, Giles uh, romanization system is T-U-N-G, which is what we see on the, the handout. Uh, since the T-U-N-G spelling is more common out there, uh, that's the one I will still maintain. For the most part, however, through the rest of the presentation, everything else is written using the pinyin romanization system. Right? So if, there, if there's any confusion, it, it's not, his name is not Tung. <coughs> it, it's, it's Dong. It's it pronounced with a, a D sound. Okay. Um, so the, throughout the history of Chinese medicine, there are lots of different currents of practice. Some of the currents of practice were clearly rooted within what, what we'll call family lineages. And prior to about the Song Dynasty, medicine was really not a profession that was one of the most respected professions in China. Right? Uh, so, you know, in, if you didn't know in ancient China, Chinese were, were f from time immemorial bureaucrats par excellence. And you know, if you really wanted your kid to have a good job when he, when he or she grew up, or mostly he grew up, unfortunately, in ancient China, you wanted them to become a bureaucrat. You wanted them to go into government service. This was really the job. So medicine, eh, not such a great job. But over time, that changed. It changed for a lot of historical, uh, historical political reason, reasons. But after the Song Dynasty, medicine became also something that a, a good Confucian scholar could do as well. <clears throat> they sort of reinvented the practice of medicine. So throughout a lot of Chinese history, you have different competing trends of practice. And just to really simplify things, right? and this, is a, this is a gross simplification, we have some people who practice within family lines, which are like many traditional artisans did, uh, people who, who did uh, martial arts, people who did arts and crafts, people who you know, all sorts of things, did ceramics, you name it. And so in this type of practice, the, the parent, usually the father, would teach one child or maybe more than one child. But it would go basically one person in each generation down the line, down the line, down the line. <clears throat> and it would became almost like a trade secret. Right? If you had a really good way to treat low back pain, you would teach your kid and they would only treat low back pain and it would, you know, all over the, the area they would come to this one person for low back pain or whatever it happens to be. There's some really very interesting cases of, uh, of modern Chinese doctors who start off like this. Like there is a golden needle Wang who Blue Poppy wrote a book about. Wang Liting, he, they translated one of his books into English. He started off learning just one technique that he learned from one person and then later on expanded out. In addition to this, of course, then we have the Confucian scholars. And the Confucian scholars were the ones who really promulgated the classics such as the Neijing, the Nanjing, the Shang Han Lun, and these other texts that we think of the classics today. They were the ones who wrote a lot about what they were doing. And they kept case studies and then they maybe didn't only teach within a family line. <clears throat> Most of the medicine that we think of today is Chinese medicine that's come down to us today in the form of TCM is really the medicine of the Confucian scholars, right? This is the medicine of the educated elite in China. The average peasant farmer could not walk into a TCM place and get the same kind of herbs or acupuncture treatment that we do today, not necessarily throughout okay. all of history. Now, of course, these lineages danced with each other over and over again. So you had family lineages that took up in Confucian lineages and back and forth. The Dong family lineage was one of these family lineages that was passed down from father to, to son for a long time. If we believe the story that is told to us from the Dong family, it goes back to the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty is roughly 200 years before the turn of the Common Era to 200 years after the turn of the Common Era. So rather than the specific dates which don't really matter, it's roughly 400 years on either side of the year zero. This is the time, the formative time, for most of the Chinese medical classics. So most scholars believe that the, the Neijing, the Nanjing, Shang Han Lun, all these books, even the Shenong Ben Saojing, were written around the time of the Han Dynasty. So this is a time of great, of great medical innovation in China, so to speak. <clears throat> now, I put a little asterisk on the PowerPoint because 
as a, as, a, as a lineage that's passed down in one family line, we don't have external, uh, we don't have external confirmation that this is the case. Right? We don't have books that date back to the Han Dynasty that say, Dong's acupuncture. Right? So we don't know for sure. We, you know, it could have been something completely made up at some point throughout Chinese history. It could go back 2,000 years. Personally, I think it does go back 2,000 years, and I think there are clues within the system, the way points are named and the way they're discussed, that sort of gives away its authentic historical roots. But that's a bigger discussion for another time. We don't have time to go into that. But regardless, we do know that the story is that this was a family lineage passed down from father to son for many generations for the last 2,000 years or so. And one of the great things that means for us and one of the exciting things is that within, you know, within this class, with all of the webinar attendees included, we have more people looking at this material today than there were in possibly a hundred generations of the family. Right? So the number of people using this medicine today is exponentially greater than at any time in all of history, which to me is very exciting. And I think it's a wonderful thing, that, a wonderful gift that, that, uh, that Dong gave us, that he taught this to the outside so that more people than just a small number of people in his family could practice the medicine. Now, <clears throat> certainly one of the things that is most obvious about the, the system to people looking on the outside is this unique set of extra points, right? So the, many people know there are lots of points that I've never seen before. My first impression of Dong's acupuncture when I came across it uh, many years ago now was there are all these points that no one ever taught me about before. Where are they from? What are they doing? So that's one of the things that draws most of us in is that there are all these, it's, it's the, both the scary thing as well as the, the sexy, exciting thing. It's like all, all these new points, but then oh, I have to memorize them. So we have to find that middle ground between memorization and, <clears throat> and, and being overwhelmed by all those points and then learning something, learning how to use them. Now that said, we also know that Dong actually was aware of and used the regular points on the, the 14 channels, 14 channels being the 12 primary channels and the do and the ren. Right? We know this especially because in his book that he wrote in 1973, he included a short chapter on his use of regular channel points. Uh, and they are definitely, in many cases, a little different. And they do track closely with some of his own unique channel points, which definitely makes us understand that he knew that there were overlap between his points and regular channel points of acupuncture. We also know that he understood where the regular points were because some of the points within his system were named after conventional channel points. Right? So later on, we'll, today, we will look at a point it's one of my favorite points in the system because it's the first I ever learned. We're going to look at a point called next to three miles, right? The tsu sanli, right? Next to three miles is because it's next to stomach 36, the leg three miles, right? Even though leg three miles point, the stomach 36, has a different name in Dong's acupuncture, we know that he knew where that point was because the, his point is named after stomach 36. We also knew that his point then overlaps stomach 36. This point called the upper, uh, the, uh, the shang, the, the uh, shang sihua, the upper, uh, sihua shang, the upper four flowers, right? Because in his book he says that Sisan Li is next to the upper four flowers. So we know then, it's the transitive principle for those of you who remember back to geometry. If A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, right? So if he says next to th stomach, next to th San Li, is next to this four flower point, right? And the name says it's next to Sanli. That means that four flower point is to Sanli, is stomach 36. So there is obviously overlap. So we will definitely see some points that are unique, that are different, some points that lie between channels, but there are some points that overlap conventional acupuncture points. There has to be. There are only so many points, places on the body where we can stick a needle. And as we'll see, acupuncture is not that precise in terms of exact location. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, Master Dong was the last member of the Dong family to practice acupuncture. Uh, he, had, he, he did have children, but none of them, as far as I know, took up the practice of acupuncture. So he was the last person in the family to practice. 
He was born in 1916 in uh, Pingdu County in Shandong Province. Shando, Shandong Province is this province up here that's the, the colored one on the map. I'm going to get bored. Yeah, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to get bored of sitting down. Are we okay? I'll apologize in advance. I, I walk around and move quickly. All right. So this area here is uh, Shandong Province. Korean, the Korean Peninsula is right over here. Shandong Province is, is where the Qingdao beer comes from. Right. Because if you didn't know, Shandong was a German colony in the time of colonization of China. And what do Germans do? They make beer. So in Shandong Province, we now have Qingdao beer comes from there. Right. That's because it's from the Germans. Right? Yeah. But uh, it's, this is the area uh, where Dong was born, and it was at the time of the ROC was the Republic of China. So this is before the, the Maoists came in and, and established the People's Republic of China. Right? That was the time period. Now, uh, Dong treated patients uh, with his father when he was a young man. This is a, pack, a, a photograph of Master Dong. He joined the Kuomintang, the KMT or the Kuomintang. These are the nationalists who were originally under Sun Yat-sen who then eventually uh, the Chiang Kai-shek took up the leadership of the Kuomintang. So he, he joined the Kuomintang army to fight the Japanese, uh, and the Japanese invaded into northern China uh, in the early years before the United States gets involved in World War II. Uh, and at that time, the Maoists and the Kuomintang were still working together somewhat to deal with the Japanese. But then, of course, most of us know the history that eventually the Kuomintang, the nationalists, and the the, the communists under Mao Zedong, they start fighting each other, vying for control of China. Now, this was a tremendously tumultuous, tumultuous time period in China. Right? Uh, even from the 1920s on, there was very little of a central government in China that had any real control over the largest portions of the country. This was sometimes known as the warlord period. There were lots of people who basically set up like they're almost their own little independent kingdoms, although they were they weren't technically independent countries, but it almost worked like that. So because of this, uh, Dong was really unable to finish any formal education. Uh, he never went to acupuncture school, even though there were acupuncture, there were TCM schools uh, in, in Republican China. He never went to any of these schools. He learned only under the tutelage of his father. And then when he was a teenager, he joined the Kuomintang army. He was a very proud, uh, you know, patriotic nationalist. And so he joined the Kuomintang army to <coughs> eventually fight against the communists. Um, again, most of us know this story. In 1949, uh, the Maoists really become victorious, uh, and the nationalists leave China. Uh, and, uh, and if the nationalists knew it was good for them, they took their entire family with them. Right? So they, would all, they all left China, they retreated to Taiwan, and actually I shouldn't even say retreated to Taiwan because there were plenty of Taiwanese there before the, the nationalists left. So they basically set up their government uh, in Taiwan with the capital of Taipei. And uh, that was the beginning of the split between the People's Republic of China on the mainland, what we call mainland China, and the Republic of China on the island of Taiwan, which we still see to this day. Right? Now, Master Dong uh, stayed in the army, he was in the military for quite a number more years. And he basically treated most of his career, he was treating fellow soldiers free of charge. Uh, and it was only in the 1960s, the early 1960s, which is you know, certainly a significant period of time after, the, uh, after 1949, that he opened his first solo clinic in Taipei, the capital of, uh, of Taiwan. While he was in Taipei, he became, effective, he became known for his very effective treatment. Uh, he, he got referrals from a lot of other TCM practitioners in the area. Uh, his students estimated that he treated over 300,000 patients in his career. He was also called in to treat various different high-level political figures, military fig figures. Uh, there is the, in the early 1970s, he goes to Cambodia to treat President Lon Nol. Uh, and those of you who maybe remember the history, Lone Null had suffered a stroke, and he was originally treated in an American uh, hospital in Hawaii, uh, because the Cambodians were, they were, the Americans and the Cambodians were fighting against the, the communist encroachment in Vietnam at the time. So uh, Lone Null had a stroke, and Master Dung was sent to treat uh, president, the president of Cambodia at the time. 
the, there are photographs of Master Dong with the president in the book that he wrote in 1973. Uh, the newspaper accounts are kind of spotty. It's one of my own little history projects now is trying to find the newspapers that actually describe this, but we're not quite, uh, that'll be released at a later date. The other interesting thing is we actually have the treatment records from when the president was treated. So we have a very clear view of what Master Dong's treatment style looked like. So that's an interesting piece that we can do at another, another time. So Master Dong in Taiwan originally, uh, eventually trained 73 students. So at some point he really had to come face to face with this idea of what's going to happen to my, my medicine, right? He didn't have an heir in his own family to take over. Uh, in the mid-1960s, in the People's Republic of China, was the time period that the Cultural Revolution was going on, right? So it was 19, really 1965, 1966, when the Cultural Revolution starts getting underway. And in mainland China, lots of things were really being destroyed wholesale. Anything related to traditional culture, traditional history, this was all being really ripped apart. Now, in Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek, because Chiang Kai-shek and Mao are always sort of like, like this at each other, Chiang Kai-shek established what was known as the, the Cultural Renaissance Movement, right? To really try to <coughs> encourage the practice of traditional Chinese arts. Uh, and so, Master Dong in the early 1960s, in 1962, took his first student, someone by the name of Lin. And then eventually, he decided to take on more and more students. He was deeply touched by this sentiment of, uh, in Taiwan of trying to preserve traditional Chinese culture. So he eventually trained 73 students directly. These were memorialized on his burial epitaph. Uh, so his students paid money to have this erected next to his tombstone, which you can still see today in Taiwan, which with all of his students that trained with him directly. And then eventually, uh, first in 1968, he produced a, a set of notes that he used to teach his students, because he would teach classes as well. And then uh, eventually in 1973 is the publication of really the first book solely devoted to his family system. Right? This was written with one of his students named Yuan Guoban and uh, was in print for a couple of years, but then eventually went out of print. But it's, it's an interesting book. Now the book is fairly basic, and what the book just does is it tells us Here's the point name, here's the location, and here are the list of diseases, the indications that it treats, with some basic needling guidelines and some other like contraindications. But it's really basically just a look at point by point by point by point going through the system. At the end of that book, as I mentioned before, there's a list of uh, his use of regular channel points. Um, <clears throat> this I, I retranslated myself and added annotations in our practical atlas of Dong's acupuncture, so that chapter is reprinted in its entirety in the Practical Atlas with commentary that, that I did. Uh, and he also had family recipes, like dietary recipes. Master Dong didn't really practice herbal medicine. We do know that he did a little bit of herbs. Uh, when you even look at the, the case record of him going to Cambodia to treat the president there, there is one of the treatments he gave him some sort of herbal medicine. He didn't list what the formula was, but he basically was like a simple tonic herb. So he did know some rudimentary Chinese herbs. Mainly he was an acupuncturist. He was an acupuncturist, acupuncturist, right? Um, <clears throat> but he also did dietary therapy. And that's something that I'm working on reading through and maybe translating. Very interesting as well, some of the dietary recipes. What happens in the early 1970s is that Taiwan establishes a licensing system for practitioners of Chinese medicine. Uh, there are, one of the criteria for getting a license was graduation from a school of Chinese medicine, uh, either in Taiwan or in the Republican China before Taiwan is established. <clears throat> Certainly, as you remember, Master Dong did not have any formal training in any medical school. Uh, so he didn't study Western medicine. He didn't have a, a TCM degree from a, from a school in the Republican China. And probably for some other political reasons that I am not privy to, he was eventually denied a license to practice in Taiwan. Uh, and there may have been political things afoot at the time. My guess is it probably was, but I don't know for sure. Right. So he was denied a license. Uh, shortly thereafter, he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Uh, and in 1975, he was gone. So it was a relatively short life by modern standards. He was, he was not, uh, not an old man. Yep. He was in his 60s. He was not an old man by a long shot. So <clears throat> I think that we're all incredibly lucky uh, today, and not 
really the benefactors are not us as clinicians, but the benefactors are our patients that we deal with. That he had the foresight and the, the generosity of spirit to teach the material outside of his family for the first time. Because, you know, my, my, my hope is that somewhere wherever he is, whether it's, you know, in the Western paradise or whether he's in a new incarnation, wherever he is, that he's happy that the material is now benefiting more and more people uh, over time. And that will continue to benefit people over time. Now then, the, the last thing I want to uh, address in terms of the history um, before we get on to more nitty-gritty in terms of clinical material is this question of orthodoxy. That comes up quite a bit. Um, I will give you a little, a little uh, caveat is you see these little tone marks. I'm, I'm a bit technologically challenged on occasion, and I can't figure out how to turn them upside down. So <laughs> that's supposed to be, in Chinese, this is a third tone. This is the dropping and rising tone. So just take the little tone mark and flip it upside down, <laughs> and we're good, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so my apology for the purists in the group who know what the tone marks look like, right? So. One of the things that I find, to be honest, fairly disturbing today within the practice of medicine is this question of, of orthodoxy and lineage. Um, so there is this saying in Chinese, the yin shui su yuan. Yin shui su yuan means when drinking water, think of the source, right? Which basically, you know, in Chinese, you know, because we're all good Confucianists, right? As much as the Chinese try to embrace other philosophies such as the Tao or Buddhism, right? We're all really good Confucianists at heart. And one of the prime, in Confucianism, in Chinese there's this saying that says of all the 10,000 greatest goods, the greatest of all the goods is xiao, is filial piety, right? Which is translated as respect for elders, you know, knowing one's one place when looking, with, looking at a teacher or a, whatever happens to be. And that's all great. I think that's all important. And I do believe that when drinking water, we should think of the source and we should be appreciative of the source. But here I have uh, another quote. <clears throat> this is, this one is, this quote is, it's been out there a long time. This is not a, I'm not the first person to quote this guy. <clears throat> this is a quote from Yaroslav Pelikan, who is a former professor uh, at Yale University. He worked in Christian theology and history. And he's talking about religion in this quote. But I think we can also, we can easily talk, we can easily use this quote to help us understand what we do in terms of medicine. You know, in modern medicine in the West, we don't worry about this because the spirit of Western science is constant, open sharing of information and debate. Maybe not constant in actual practice, but in theory, that's how the scientific method improves knowledge, is that we all look at each other's knowledge, we criticize each other, we, we build on it and we move forward through time, right? And I personally believe that this is the original spirit of, the, of Chinese Confucianism as well, right? So there is a quote from the Analects of Confucius where he says, basically just, Confu and I'm paraphrasing, we can look through for the exact quote later if anyone wants to see it. Confucius basically says, you know, he doesn't want a student who just does everything he does. He wants to be able to give the student the main idea and let them really expand outwards themselves, right? That's how knowledge continues to move and increase. So this is a quote from, from Dr. Pelican. Are we okay? Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to move the mouse. All right. So this is a quote from Dr. Pelican. <clears throat> he says, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition lies in conversation with the past while remembering where we are and when we are and that it is we who have to decide. Traditionalism supposes that nothing should ever be done for the first time, so, that, so all that is needed to solve any problem is to, to arrive at the supposedly unanimous testimony of this homogenized tradition. Right. So this is the difference of drinking water and thinking of the source realizing that we may be 10,000 miles from the source and we can appreciate where it came from, but hey, maybe I'll boil water and make tea instead of just drinking the water. It's still the water, but somehow it's a little different, right? Not that I forgot where it came from, 
but I may be doing something different from it than just taking it as water. Does that make sense? So the idea is that over time we need to continue to expand and develop the field. It's not like Master Dong taught this and we do everything exactly how we taught because that's simply how we taught and there's no question about it. That's a ridiculous supposition, which is why the question of orthodoxy bothers me a lot. Right? The important thing eventually, and I love the philosophy and the history more than the next guy. I really do. But the, eventually, the important thing is what actually happens in the clinical encounter with our patients. If we can use the material and improve on it and change it slightly, right, and the patient gets better, in my book, that's all that matters. Because, again, I am primarily physician and only secondarily philosopher and historian. Right? So that's my encouragement to you is to really, you know, the question of orthodoxy is not, it's not so important. Right? And this is another, this is another uh, great quote. If you have not read this article by Professor, by Volker Scheid, you should go, all of you everywhere in the world should go find this article. Uh, I believe it's available on his website. It's from the European Journal of Oriental Medicine. <coughs> Fantastic article, and this is one of my favorite quotes from this article. It says, lineages are no less a social institution than modern universities and no greater guarantor of authenticity or clinical results. Right. Whether it be a lineage-based system, whether it be going to a university wearing a cap and gown and that, you know, the funny, and I have a cap and gown, I love it. <laughs> I, t I, only go to, I only go to graduation ceremonies so I can actually wear my own cap and gown as a faculty member because it's, it's great. I don't get to wear it around at home, right? But that is, that is a social institution and it's created by people for certain <coughs> social purposes, political purposes, economic purposes, right? There's always a reason why all of this is done. And it's no different. Whether we're talking about a traditional lineage-based system, whether we're talking about modern universities, whether we're talking about, you name it, in terms of transmission of knowledge. They're all human-based and they all have certain pluses and negatives and neither one is the guarantor that this is better than that for whatever reason. Right? In the end, it matters what you as a clinician can do, not how you got the information. Whether you got it from a seminar or going through a Beicher ceremony where you knelt in front of your, your teacher. Okay? So, that's out of the quest. That's out of the, that's the question is out in the open. We talked a little bit about it. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, Dong's acupuncture. This is... Uh, so we'll first we'll talk about some of the characteristics of Dong's acupuncture. This is from Dr. Wang, who has also done classes here. Uh, that uh, what a really fantastic uh, practitioner of Dong's acupuncture he is. He says, Dong's acupuncture is tian, yi, and xiao. It's simple, easy, and effective. And again, uh, my apology, you have to turn the, the tone mark upside down. So it's a falling and rising. Right? Simple, easy, and effective. So one of the things we'll see with Dong's acupuncture that characterizes the system is that we use a relatively small number of needles. Right? So one of the things that you, everyone's homework, I was a high school teacher for a number of years, so I like to give people homework. Right? So everyone's homework for this week is to see, it's like the limbo. Right? How low can you go? Right? How many needles can you get down to and still get effect Right? As an exercise. You know, people come to my clinic and they are, one of the things patients I hear all the time from patients, I love to hear, they say, you know what? I'm afraid of needles. I don't really like needles. And I tell them, if you came in and said, I love needles, load me up, I'd be more worried than if you told me you were afraid of needles. That's okay. And I explain to people that I'm a minimalist. In my clinic, I tend not to use the typical treatment more than six or seven needles. And not six or seven points bilaterally. Six or seven total needles. If I can get it lower, in my book, that's better. Right? And I'm not saying everyone has to practice this way. But I will encourage you all to see what you can do with a fewer number of, of needles and a fewer number of, number of points. I guarantee if you, for the average patient, there's always going to be someone out there who likes 20, 30, 40, 50 plus needles. But for the average patient, if, you, if they came to you and said, Okay, I have whatever, I have back pain. And you gave them a choice. You said, okay, I can treat you with two needles or three needles, or I can treat you with 20 needles. What do you prefer? Equal effect, what do you prefer? Most patients will say, huh, well, give me the two or three needles then. Right? 
Some people won't, but in my clinic, most people will say, then just give me the two or three needles. So my, even if you don't use these points, my suggestion to you is see what you can do even with the acupuncture you do already to try to get to as few needles as possible, right? So treatments can be relatively simple and yet at the same time treat root and branch, treat chronic conditions, and be very effective at doing all of the above, right? We don't need a lot of needles. If you go to a Chinese language bookstore where they have medical books, I was just, one yesterday, just at one yesterday with, with, uh, with our host, uh, Tina. Even there, I saw on the bookshelf, right, one needle treatment strategies, a book in Chinese, one needle treatment strategies. If you go to China to a Chinese language bookstore, you'll see so-and-so famous doctors, one needle treatment strategies, where they give you a list of like 100 diseases, and here's the one needle with case studies that they use to treat the entire condition. So my, that's my goal eventually, to get just down to one needle per patient. I'm not there yet, but someday maybe. 20 or 30 more years, maybe we'll be there. So simple, easy, effective. It's also easy because there's no complicated needle manipulation. There's no drainage technique, supplementation technique. I mean, you can do it if you want, but Master Dong did not do it. And I, I do not do this in my clinic for the most part. Once in a while, when I do something like scalp acupuncture, I do supplementing and draining because that's how I was taught. And I, I, feel, uh, I don't feel secure enough in my, in my scalp acupuncture abilities yet to not do it exactly how I was taught. But in Dong's acupuncture, there is no need to do supplementing or draining needle technique. In Dong's acupuncture, supplementing or draining is done more by point selection rather than needle technique. Some points and some areas of the body have a more moving, coursing, dispersing function. Some areas and some point groups have more of a supplementing and consolidating function. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, over the course of today and then certainly tomorrow when we talk about bloodletting for those of you who will be with us tomorrow. Okay. So again, in Dong's acupuncture, supplementing and draining is done more by point selection rather than just needle technique. Right? And to some extent, this agrees with some of the, t uh, some of the chapters of the Nanjing. In the <coughs> Nanjing, there are some chapters that suggest that needle technique is not the most efficient way to do supplementing and draining. It's by point selection. Right? In the Nanjing, it's point selection based on five phase relationships between the Jinging, Shu Jing, He points. Right? So are we needling the, the, the mother point or the child point of that phase of the channel to do supplementing or drainage, right? They would deny, perhaps, that you can supplement and drain every point equally. And I personally agree with that. I think that some points have better function with supplementing and better function with draining. So in Dong's acupuncture, you don't have to worry about 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9 twirling clockwise, counterclockwise, this way, that way. Forget about it, right? I hereby liberate you. You can simply do basic stimulation of the needle until you... Uh, until you get effect, um, which also to some extent comes to the question of, uh, of um, de qi. So before we go on, then I'll just talk about this briefly because this question has come up frequently. Uh, if you look at the medical classics and my regular teaching gig at PCOM in New York City is I teach the Neijing and sometimes the Nanjing courses. So if you look at the early medical classics, the Neijing is very clear that you need you need the qi in order to get effect from acupuncture. Right? This, is, this is incontrovertible. Right? We need the qi. However, the Neijing doesn't tell us what the hell de qi is. Okay? So the, this, no, this is very true. The Neijing doesn't say, by the way, de qi is where you go like this, and the patient feels an electric sensation going down the channel. It doesn't say this. It simply doesn't say this. Which is why today we have so many different interpretations of what, of what De Qi possibly can be. When I, was in, when I first learned Dung's acupuncture, I was told that uh, in order to get it to work, you had to use 28 gauge needles, like 28 gauge two inch needles. I had a hard time finding a supplier who still stocked these. And, uh, and my, my, patients <laughs> my patients dealt with it. They had 28 gauge needles all the time. I do also have to say that I do believe pain on, on needling is more a function of the acupuncturist than the size of the needles. Right? So part of it has to do with your needle technique skill. In my clinic, I only do freehand insertions. 
when I trained at the New England School of Acupuncture, we were only allowed to do freehand insertions. We were, the tubes were forbidden, forget it, we could not use tubes. So that's how I trained, that's what I do to this day. Uh, and even with 20 gauge needles, most patients are okay. It's really not a problem. But then after practicing Dong's acupuncture for a few years and really sort of thinking about it, I realized, you know what? In Taiwan in 1960, everyone used 20 gauge needles. This was not unique to Master Dong, right? All the Chinese in that day and age used much thicker needles. So you can, I will tell you, without any hesitation, you can use thinner needles and the points will still work. You can also use needle technique that doesn't shoot electric sensations down the arm or the foot and the needles, the points will still work. My personal opinion about De Qi is that De Qi is something that is best experienced by the acupuncturist and not the patient. And perhaps this is my, the influence that I have from uh, studying Japanese acupuncture, which I did very early on as part of my foundational training. I did a lot of Japanese acupuncture and I practiced the Toyohari system, where we do, if you don't know what Toyohari, you don't even have to put the needle in. Right? I remember asking my teacher once, uh, this is Mr. Kohara up at, uh, in, in Boston. I said, Mr. Kohara, if you don't have to put the needle in the body, why do you use a needle? And he said, because I'm an acupuncturist. So I thought that was a very good, uh, he was a walking Zen koan, right? So it was a very good koan-like answer. But we know that acupuncture works. <coughs> we can't say that Japanese acupuncture doesn't work because they don't have strong dochi sensation. It's ridiculous because it does work. And I've seen very, very minimal needling with very shallow needles have tremendous outcomes, right? So the idea that the qi has to be this very strong sensation is a fallacy. We can say absolutely it is not true. Because if it were true, that means that all these other acupuncturists would have no effect whatsoever beyond placebo, which is simply not the case, right? If you put a needle in the body and the patient's complexion changes, if they move their arm and the pain gets better, if you feel the pulse and the pulse changes, of course you have de qi. You've activated the movement of qi and blood in the body, and that, I believe, is what the classics really mean that de qi is. So as we go through this, this material, know that when I'm doing needling myself, I never ask, I don't care, honestly, I don't care what the patient feels. I personally believe patients are very poor judges of what they are feeling in most cases. I am more concerned with what I notice, what I feel at the needle site, I almost check the pulse after every needle insertion or two, like Japanese acupuncturists do, even though I practice Chinese acupuncture mostly now. But you can feel de qi, or you can see de qi, and you can see the result of de qi without asking the patient if they have this tremendously painful sensation. Okay? People can disagree with me, but I know I'm right on this one. So. <laughs> and you experiment with it, okay? So one of the reasons why it's simple and easy is because we use a few number of points. <coughs> we don't have any complex needle manipulations, right? And the results are very effective. And one of the reasons I practice Dong's acupuncture is because I find it works tremendously well for the vast majority of my patients. Okay. Everyone okay so far? All right. So some of the other characteristics, basic characteristics of Dong's acupuncture, it is a pre-TCM classical acupuncture system. Uh, I, I like using the word classical and I hate using the word classical at the same time. Uh, I dislike using the word classical because today it's become a marketing tool more than anything else. I personally don't believe in classical versus modern acupuncture. I believe there's acupuncture done well and acupuncture done poorly. And acupuncture done well, by definition, has reference to early classical medical texts uh, and makes use of it. Not the acupuncture done poorly can have reference to classical medical texts as well. But I think that acupuncture done well like the traditional versus traditionalism, acupuncture done well understands where we were, but that it's today we have to make decisions about how we do it and how we apply it. But that said, we can classify Dong's acupuncture as a pre-TCM system. It did evolve in a day and age and independently of the modern TCM movement in, the mainland, in mainland China. Uh, as I mentioned already, we have this extensive use of extra channel points, of extra points, sometimes on the channels, sometimes between channels. One of the other characteristics of the system that most people are, mo are probably familiar with is that we do almost exclusive distal, or better, it's actually more, more proper, is distant needling. Because it's not always distal 
anatomically to the site of disease. Sometimes it can be proximal, sometimes it can be opposite side, right? But it's away from the site of disease, right? In the Suwen, there's a chapter that, that says, the superior acupuncturist treats right from left, left from right, leads yin from yang and yang from yin, right? I don't know about you, but I like to be the superior acupuncturist. So we'll take that quote from the Neijing to justify what we do here, right? There are actually many places in the Neijing that describe this idea of needling away from the site of disease. There is a uh, needle technique in the seventh chapter of the, of the Ling Shu called the, uh, the distal point or dis distant path, Yuan Dao Tse, distant path needling, right? And so they, there's this description of this type of needling throughout the Neijing. Uh, it's listed in lots of places. So there's an almost exclusive use of distal point treatment and points are needled mostly contralaterally to the site of disease, right? The other thing I would like to encourage you to consider is that needling does not have to be done bilaterally all the time, right? I know that many of us are taught this in TCM school, right? Needle the four gates, it has to be two large intestine four, two liver three. If you've ever had experience with Japanese acupuncture systems today, we know that they don't automatically do bilateral needling. Right? Sometimes points are only needled on one side, and there are different protocol algorithms that help us decide what side of the body to needle in, that, in those systems. When we look at the classical texts and it says, oh yeah, for low back pain, needle this point, very rarely does it say, oh yeah, and do it bilaterally, by the way. Okay? So I would also like to liberate you from the need to needle bilaterally all the time. If you like to, knock yourself out. If you don't like to, you don't have to. For internal medicine conditions, where the side, for pain, this is obvious. If pain is on one side of the body, we can needle the opposite side. If pain is on the front, we can needle the back and vice versa. For internal conditions, we don't, you, there may not be easy to decide, okay, one side or the other side. If you want to needle bilaterally, it's, it's okay, right? So I'm not saying you don't have to, but Master Dong typically did not, right? If we look at the case studies from his clinic, he, did, he oftentimes did not do bilateral needling. I mentioned already that we do minimal number of needles per treatment. So usually there are fewer than six needles. And again, this is not six points bilateral, right? This is six needles total. Okay. And then he also made use of special point combination and stimulation techniques, including a heavy emphasis on bloodletting, which we'll talk about more tomorrow uh, as we go through class. Is it uh, legal in the state of California? Blood I am not a Californian. So you will have to talk to California experts about that. You know. um, there are lots of places where we do bloodletting, and uh, I will leave political comments out of a recorded uh, webinar. <laughs> if you want to ask me my political opinions, uh, I was involved in uh, acupuncture politics for a long time, and I, st I still sit on the New Jersey State Acupuncture Board. So you know, if you want more political uh, opinions that are unfiltered, then ask me later. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so more about uh, Dong's points. So what we have here in the title is a portion of the, the title to Master Dong's book from 1973. In Master Dong's book from 1973, the, <coughs> the name of the book was the Dong lineage study of this which the first word is zheng jing. Zheng means upright, orthodox, regular. Jing is the jing of the jing law, the, the channels. Then this qi is, the qi, this qi is the same as the, in the qi jing ba mai, the eight extraordinary vessels, right? So it means something that is different or unique. And the last word shui means point, right? So one of the things I will also put right out there at the beginning here, so we all understand this clearly, is that Master Dong, in his own clinic, from my understanding, and I was not there, certainly, in his own clinic, he did not talk about theory. When I lived in Asia, I lived in Japan for quite some time. When I lived in Asia, this was uh, something that I had personal experience with. I, I lived in Okinawa for, for a while as a graduate student, and I studied uh, Okinawan martial arts there. And I remember, what, I remember asking my teacher, you know, what does this do? What, is, what does this do? And he would always look at me and say, go hit the makiwara harder. 
You know, and that's the thing you hit. That's the piece of wood that's wrapped with straw on top. He said, just go hit it harder and the answer will come to you. <laughs> so he wasn't about to give me any, his, his idea was you just keep on doing it over and over and over again. You keep on looking at me and you'll understand. Don't bother asking me questions. Maybe once in a while if you asked a really good question or a really pokey question, he would answer. Right? Did so, you get it? Hmm? Did you get it? No, I had to hit it harder. <laughs> I didn't have, most of the time you didn't get answers to your questions. Master Dung was the same way. I mean, obviously, did, you hit it yourself? did I hit it myself? Oh, yeah, I had it. Did you get the answer, the answer? eventually? Maybe. That's a secret. I can't tell you the no. secrets. Go hit it harder. Hit it harder. <laughs> but no, Master Dung, was, Master Dung was the same way. He did not really talk much about why he was doing things. His, his, the quote that we have from some of his students was basically, observe for yourself and you'll figure it out. Right? Certainly he, didn't, he did ask, he'd answer basic questions. Right? It's not like he never talked at all. But he did not talk about a, an underlying theory for why and when he was choosing points, for the most part. I mean, it was very, very simple discussions. So that, that means that there are lots of opinions today. Right? One of the problems in the Dung acupuncture world is that we have a very small number of authors writing in any language other than Chinese. Right? There's one author in, in, Chi in Taiwan today who's, by himself, he's written over 12 books on Dung's acupuncture, none of which have been translated into English. Right? And so this would make us think that the tradition is fairly homogenous, and it's not. Right? There are differing, differing opinions on not only why we're using these points, but even where they're located. Right? Basic information about where points are located is different from person to person. You know, partly because maybe they saw Master Dong at different times in his career and he changed his mind. All of us grow as a clinician. Right? This is, we see this in martial arts. I'm, a, I'm an old-time, old long-term martial artist. We see this in martial arts traditions. You know, someone who studied with Moihei Weishiba in, 1960, you know, in 1930 versus 1960 learn different material. And each person thinks that they alone have the truth because they saw the master do it that way. And it's, it's not true, right? Because his opinion changes over time, his students will change over time, the material changes over time, and it's okay, right? So when we talk about theory, keep in mind that this is not original that Master Dong came from his mouth. And there are differing opinions. The theory that I will teach you today is a theory that I personally have found most effective and I've thought about a lot for many years that I think is useful for us as TCM students right, who have a background in, in other aspects of Chinese medicine to understand the points. One of the things I will say is that one of the controversies in Dong's acupuncture is this idea that it has nothing to do with the regular channels of acupuncture, right? that it's a completely different system that it has nothing to do with the 12 primary channels of Du and Ren. My thinking is that this word right here we see in the title of his book, right, the Zheng Jing, the primary, the orthodox channels, extra points. My opinion is that this gives us the idea that we do have a relationship to the 12 primary channels. And my feeling is even if Master Dong wasn't thinking of it himself, if we've we're practicing Chinese medicine. If you truly believe the channels exist, if you truly believe that you're just not making it up, then by definition they have to deal with the primary channels. Everything we do has to deal with the primary channels. Right? You tell your patients that antibiotics are cold and bitter, the damage of the spleen. What is that? That is a Western therapy that had nothing to do with Chinese medicine that we're explaining from the viewpoint of Chinese medicine now. Right? You tell your patients, don't drink orange juice for, because it does certain things in terms of Chinese medicine. Well, you know what? They weren't drinking orange juice from a carton in ancient China. That's something we've created. We've put our understanding on modern phenomenon. So even if Dong's acupuncture originally, in his mind, did not have to do with the primary channels, we can certainly use them to help us understand why we might use the channel, why might, we might use the points in a certain ways. Does that make sense? So again, I'm, I'm less concerned with orthodoxy. Maybe it is how we thought, maybe it's not. We don't know, he didn't tell us. And he's not here to explain it anymore. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing is that they're distributed over the entire body. So we do have points from the top of the body down to the bottom of the body. The points traditionally organized by zone of distribution, not by channel. So the way we learn 
points today in TCM is we learn, okay, lung channel, lung 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way down to lung 11, large intestine 1, all the way up to 21. We learn them channel by channel. In Dong's acupuncture, the way the material is organized is by zone of the body. Okay? Zone of the body, we have, uh, we have a number of zones. So the first zone is the, the fingers. We see the palm is zone 2. The forearm is zone 3 from the wrist to the elbow. Zone 4 is the elbow to the shoulder. Zone 5 is the bottom of the foot. Zone 6 is the, the dorsal foot and around to the ankle. Zone 7 is the ankle to the knee. Zone 8 is the knee up to the hip, right, this upper leg. Zone 9 are the ears. Zone 10 is the head and the face. And then we have the trunk. The, tr the dorsal and ventral trunk form their own zonal areas, okay? Uh, and there are charts, so there's not a chart in the handout, but there's, in any book on Dong's acupuncture, basically, you can find a chart that describes the zones. It's pretty basic. When we have the, the naming and the numbering of the points, because this is a quest, this question actually even came up last week on our one hour introduction webinar. One of the questions is where all these funny numbers come from, right? So we'll see that every point has a name in Chinese, because in Chinese, that's what the acupuncturists know. If you go to China and say, where is uh, stomach 36? Someone may, I, I have no idea. Where's number 30? They have to count, right? Because they know the point as leg three miles. So suddenly, that's how they know the point. Every point has a name. The numbering system was added to make it easier for those of us who don't speak Chinese, or like me who speak Chinese fairly poorly, right? It makes it easier for us to understand and remember the material. Right? So same thing here. We have a, a name of the point in Chinese. So this one's called Lingu. And then it has a number, 22.05. Master Dong would not have known what 22.05 was. This was added by his students later on to help when we translate the material into English. The first, right, the first one, 22, means it's zone 2 of the body, which is the palm. The reason why they repeat the 22, because in Chinese, if you say first section, ibu, arbu, sanbu, right, it doesn't mean section one, two, and three. It means one section, two sections, three sections, right? So we double the number so that we know it's section one, section two, section three. Don't get hung up on that. If you don't like the double two, then don't worry about it. So when we see one, one before a point, it means it's on the fingers. When we see two, two before the point, it's on the palm. Three, three is on the forearm. Four, four is on the upper arm, and etc. That's what that means. The number after that, 05, simply means it has nothing to do, it's not important at all. It only means that in Master Dong's original book from 1973, it was the fifth point in the list. It doesn't mean it's going in a specific order, right? It's not like in the large intestine channel, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's in order. The numbers don't have, it doesn't mean it's in a specific direction, right? All it means is that it's the fifth one in the book. Right? You will see today, when we go through our, our points, is that some points do not have a number. This is because these points were not included in Master Dong's original book. Okay? So they were points that we can talk about maybe where they came from later. Let's just take a 30 second breather to change the tape. What time is our, Donna, what time is our break break? Half an hour. Half an hour, okay, that's fine. It's always easier to stand up here because I get to, if you need to stand up and stretch, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no, it's totally hard. And you don't have the luxury of being at home where you can take a tea break or a bathroom break, right? <laughs> Okay, so the, we'll see some points don't have a number. It is clear to us today that, um, that there are some points that Master Dong, for whatever reason, did not include in his book. Uh, there are some that would argue that if it didn't include it in his book, it's not a real point. But there are plenty of direct students in Taiwan that say, no, Master Dong taught me this point. It was not in the book. So we don't know why. There are some points that he maybe decided 
You just, I mean, when I can tell you as, as someone who's written books, at some point you just have to say, okay, I'm done. Just go print it. Because you never, <coughs> I drove Donna crazy this week with my PowerPoint. I kept on thinking, well, maybe I want to do this point instead. Maybe I want to do this point instead. And so I kept on changing my mind. I was like, oh, maybe I need a, a little bit better description here or something like that. Then at some point you have to say, okay, I'm done. It's going to be as good as it gets. So maybe Master Dong just decided, okay, these are the points I'm going to include. I'm not going to include all of them. We don't know. Maybe they weren't points that he liked a lot in his later years, but he did when he was younger. We, we don't know. And then there are other points that his students also developed, which will people, other people will say, well, then it's not a real point. It's ridiculous. Of course it's a real point. If we only, if we only looked at the original points, did you know in the Neijing there were only like 150 points mentioned? All the heart channel points, heart seven, you know, heart nine, eight, all of them, none of them are listed in the Neijing. If we stopped at the Neijing, we'd never have half of the acupuncture points we have today. Someone expanded the system at some point. We added the heart channel points at some point. Right? They were not original to the system. So even though these points, some of the points may not have been points that Master Dung taught, as long as they're added to the system with the same intention, the same thought pattern, and the same methodology as the other points, in my book, they're part of the system now. So eventually the system will expand. So some of the points in the handout you will see have no number, only a Chinese name. It's because these only exist when the Chinese language materials, literature, that have not really been translated fully into English. So that means these points don't get a number. I'm not going to presume to create a new number for them. Okay. Uh, originally, the points were associated, not associated with channels, but what was known as a, we translate as a reflex area. Right? The word shenjing in Chinese really means nerve. But we know in modern times, so in Master Dong's original book, he would say, oh yeah, this point is associated with the lung nerve or the heart nerve, right? Or the spleen nerve or the nerve of the brain or the nerve of the uterus. We know in medicine, there's no one nerve of the uterus, right? But what he was doing was choosing Western terms. We'll talk about that again shortly, right? When we translate it into English, most people translate it as reflex area or reaction area because we know it's not a nerve. But it's a it's, it's way that we're sanitizing the material. Just like today we talk about pathogenic factors, external pathogenic factors. If that's not a sanitization of the original Chinese, I don't know what is. Right? Because the original term in Chinese is a disease evil. Right? The word is evil and the word literally means something that's malevolent, something that's destructive. Whatever it happens to be, it's, the wind is an evil, cold is an evil. Right? This comes out of a history of demonic medicine in very, very early Chinese dynastic periods. When we translate it as pathogenic factor, it's because we want to make it sound more scientific and more sexy. It's being disingenuous to the original term, I believe. Right? So we translate this as reflex area because we're embarrassed to say it's the lung nerve. But that's okay. Right? So for this, this is a bigger topic of discussion. We're not going to really touch on this much. But just so you know, in many of the books on Dong's acupuncture, you'll see this term, reflex area. Uh, just know that originally it was meant to be nerve. Most likely, Master Dong meant channel. When he said it belonged to the lung nerve, he meant that it belonged, had something to do with the lung channel. His conception of the lung channel. Right? When, he had to, when he said so there are diseases of the nerves and of the blood vessels, he basically said there are diseases of qi and blood. So we have to sort of retranslate back into traditional uh, concepts. And the last thing that's important is every zone of the body functions like a microsystem. Right? So today we have a very limited number of times. So we can only do a, a certain number of points. But if you look at a book on Dong's acupuncture, you'll see on the fingers there are points that treat the entire body. On the hand, there are points that treat the entire body. On the forearm, there are points that treat the entire body, etc. Right? So theoretically, we can get to the entire body from any part of the body. Right? So this idea of microsystem becomes, in my opinion, very important to help us understand what we're doing, not only with Dong's acupuncture, with all acupuncture. I believe this, this holds true for all acupuncture, personally. All right, everyone okay with that? So the other thing that's kind of fun is that certain zones have different characteristics. So even though you can get to the entire body through all the different zones, zones have like a flavor. So the flavor, for example, of zone 1, 2, and 10, which are the fingers, 
the hands and the head, is that these areas, and, it, and nothing's 100%, there are always some exceptions to these ideas, but in general, we can, we can generalize that these areas treat acute conditions, they get fast symptom resolution, but they may not be the best at maybe long-term stabilization of chronic patients. So if someone comes in, comes in with an acute injury, it's beautiful. One or two points on the fingers or on the hand, maybe the head, works like that. Fantastic, absolutely. And yes, certain points on the hands we can see treat chronic conditions as well, but in general, that's our go-to zone for this kind of condition. Right? Why is it? Think about it. Hands versus feet. Which one is yin, which, is one, which one is yang? Right. This is yang. Hand is yang. Foot is yin. Okay? So far so good? All right. Now, distal versus proximal. That's distal and this is proximal. Which is yin, which is yang? This is yang. Distal is yang. Proximal is yin. We all know this as TCM practitioners, so it's not a surprise. The hand is yang within yang. Right? It's distal on the upper limb. Characteristic of yang is fast moving, changing, right? Things are coursing, moving, beautiful. So we have an acute condition, we have especially pain, stagnation, we want to get moving, we're using yang of yang, right? The leg, zone seven and eight, right? The lower leg and zone eight, we use more for chronic conditions, right? This is a significant departure from TCM. When I'm usually teaching this in a group of 30, 20, 30 people, I go through the exercise of asking how many people this week needled something on the leg? So we'll do it with three people here, right? How many people here needled something on the leg this week, up here? Okay? Now, of the two of you who did, it was at a point that wasn't gallbladder 31, spleen 10, or stomach 34? Three. Those three, right? <laughs> I know because I've, <laughs> I've done this experiment so many times. So we're either needling gallbladder 31, spleen 10, stomach 34, and even stomach 34. Stomach, stomach 32. Stomach 32? Okay, that's a good option. 30. 30. 30. Well, up, okay, so that's closer to the trunk. Bladder higher up. Right, so we do it, but it's not as common. In my clinic, every day, people get needled on this area. Not once a week, but every day in my clinic, someone gets needled in zone 8 of the body. Why? Because I tend to see very chronic recalcitrant patients. Not to say they don't get needled elsewhere as well, but <coughs> we definitely see this area needled commonly. Why? Think about it. Okay? Yang, yin. Okay? If the foot is distal and this is proximal, that's yang down there and this is yin up here. So this is yin within yin. So if we want to do more consolidation, right, to hold on to chi and blood, to do what's called like the, the, the banking or astringing, we use points up here, right? If we're using, let's say someone is pregnant and we want to keep them pregnant, we use points up here, right? Because we want to hold on to everything, okay? So it's not rocket science. It's really basic understanding of the yin and yang of the body. Right? In the Practical Atlas, I have a long essay on this idea and how this idea is developed. And this is my idea. This is, I was told that these are the zones that do this, and it's my thinking of why they're doing this. So this hopefully is my contribution to theory as to why. Okay. So we will see that certain zones of the body have different characteristics. The points on the trunk are almost exclusively bled in Dong's acupuncture. We don't needle the trunk. There are a few points on near small intestine 9 and 10, and there is a point that overlaps bladder 20, uh, 20 the, the Sanjiao Shu 22 and 23, and the kidney shoe point. Aside from those four points, all of the points on the trunk are exclusively bled. There's no needling of the trunk, at least in Dong's system originally. You can needle the trunk certainly, but in, he did not. We'll talk more about those bloodletting zones. We'll talk about all those bloodletting zones tomorrow as we go through bloodletting. Um, the trunk, because it de deals with bloodletting, deals more with chronic diseases. Right? 
bleeding, one of the main functions of bloodletting is for the treatment of blood stasis, uh, and then other types of s significant stasis patterns. So my opinion is that eventually bloodletting is very important. And if Calif in California now you're not doing bloodletting for whatever reason, uh, at least you guys all do herbs. But then you have to use herbs, I think. Right? On the East Coast, you know, and in some parts of the, a lot of parts of the country, you don't have to study herbs to become a, an acupuncturist. Right? In, in New Jersey, if you want to use herbs, you have to study it, but you don't have to study it. So I tell people, if you're not using herbs, then you must do the three things of bleeding, moxa, and needling. If you're not doing those three things, you're not doing acupuncture, in my opinion. If you can't do moxa or bleeding in your clinic for whatever reason, then my opinion is you must be doing herbs or dietary therapy or something really else because I, I don't think you're going to get... It's, again, it's my opinion only, and people can flame the chat room as they like, but that's, that's my opinion, and I'll stand by it. <laughs> that's my class, and, and so you can go ahead and flame. It's all right. <coughs> All right, everyone happy with that so far? Okay. One of the things that, I, uh, that I'll also bring up right now is that we will see when we are looking at the different point dis diagrams. We will see in the point diagrams that <coughs> oftentimes Master Dong uses Western terminology. Okay? So you'll see that the, like, the indications for the points are things like nephritis or... Uh, you know, bone spurs, or uh, you'll see, you'll see like you know, postural hemiplegia. You won't see, you won't see, you won't see wind strike. You'll see postural hemiplegia, or you'll see uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, polio, or post polio syndrome, something like that. So we see a lot of Western medical diagnoses in the list of points. I'm here to tell you also that this was not unique to Dong's acupuncture, and it does not mean that Dong's acupuncture treats Western diseases. Dong's acupuncture is Chinese medicine. It works with a Chinese logic to understand diseases, and it does not mean that everyone with post-polio syndrome you treat with the same point. Right? What was happening in China at this time was something that was a sort of a, a social, a, a medical phenomenon. This is a quote from the same article I, uh, I put up a quote from before. This is uh, Volker Scheid's article. He says, after 1929, when Chinese physicians decided to move their medicine into the domain of state, to gain for it equality before the law, a new strategy was needed. Right? This was happening even in, keep in mind that in Republican China, they wanted to outlaw Chinese medicine. Right? It's, not, you know, it's not the Maoists that took everything out of Chinese medicine. It's ridiculous. In Republican China, they wanted to westernize. In Asia at this time, most, if you didn't know in Japan, they also tried to get rid of traditional acupuncture for a while, right? Because they wanted to westernize. This was something that was going on. And the people practicing Chinese medicine or traditional medicine, whether it be Chinese, Korean, Japanese at the time, this was a strategy, right? And so here we said that in order to move their medicine into the domain of state, basically to gain for it, legitimiz to legitimize what they were doing, to gain for it equality before the law, so they had a right to practice, a new strategy was needed. An initial suggestion put forward by the newly established Institute of National Medicine under the directorship of Lu Yuanlei was to accomplish this integration by abolishing Chinese medical disease terms altogether and replace them with biomedical nosologies. So the, the zeitgeist of the period was the abandonment of traditional Chinese medical terms in favor of Western medical terms, which is why Master Dong chose the word nerve rather than channel. Right? Why he chose post-polio syndrome instead of way atrophy disorder. Does that make sense? Right? And we know this is true because he said it himself. Right? He said that in, in basically he decided to choose Western terms to modernize this old system of medicine that he was practicing. Right? This is, was a quote from his handwritten notes from 1968. Okay? So part of the challenge we have today in Dong's acupuncture is to take the, the Western disease terms and re-engineer 
what the hell do they mean in terms of Chinese medicine? How can we use it? If we use it based only on Western disease names, then we're not practicing Chinese medicine anymore. And I personally think we're not practicing Dong's acupuncture anymore. Right? My feeling is that we're practicing acupuncture in Chinese medicine when we're using, right, what makes Chinese medicine Chinese medicine is not an acupuncture needle, right? It's the methodology, the way we're thinking of things. That's the most important thing, right? Does that make sense? Okay. That's part of our challenge as well. Okay. How close are we to our break, Ms. Donna? That's up to you. Well, my suggestion is this is a good spot because it's a good cutoff point. So you decide what you guys usually do is okay. Let's take a 10-minute break because this class is really interesting and we want to get back to it as soon as possible. <laughs> so we'll be back at 10.30, guys. Okay. <laughs>